Well, it's 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I realize that there might be a few people that might still be coming in, but I want to make sure to respect everyone's time. As we get started, I just want to do a quick sound check. Can everyone hear me okay? And it looks like Lawanda, you can hear me. Erica, can you hear me? And can you guys um, see the PowerPoint too as well? All right, so Wanda, you could see the PowerPoint. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, now, uh, I'd like you to please mute your microphones, which you guys, seems like you guys already have, um, and then unmute it at any time you want to share your thoughts or have any questions. Uh, just muting your microphone cuts down on the background noise. Uh, so as we get started, um, this is what tonight's agenda looks like. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Module 5 live session. This is an overview of the agenda, um, the overview of tonight's agenda um, for the Module 5 live session. We will start out with introductions. Um, then we'll have live classroom expectations and important reminders. Uh, we'll check uh, in on how the course is going and then dive into some lessons on um, content. Uh, at the end, we will review learning styles and teaching strategies from last week and go over some information for this week's reading in Chapter 8. And then you guys will have time to um, ask any questions that you may have uh, regarding the class and the information. So, all right. So, as most of you guys probably know, I just want to go over a little bit of, um, well, the introductions. So, um, uh, I want to share a little, little bit about myself um, and then hear a little bit about each of you guys. So uh, my name, um, you know, obviously it's Mike and I am currently an education supervisor for a Head Start program in Denver Metro. Um, my favorite children's book changes from time to time. Uh, my current favorite book right now is, well, there's a lot of them. I really like um, the cr Little Critter books. I usually re really read them to my daughter, who is three years old. Uh, has a lot of life lessons um, in there, too, as well. Um, and She likes to see the spiders and the grasshoppers and always points them out to me, which I think is kind of cute. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, that's a little bit about me now. I will ask you guys to share a little bit about yourself, um, where you live, uh, your name, your favorite children's book, and why. Um, my name is Lawanda. I'm from Minnesota. Um, the Llama Llama series is the book that I like the most. I don't know, I just enjoyed all the stuff that Lama Lama gets into with his mother and how she helps him. And I just think about it when I read to all my grandkids. I have four, the oldest being 13, so starting off with him, and now I have a two-year-old that is getting into the series. So I just always enjoyed the Lama Lama series. 
Awesome. Yeah, I, I read them quite a bit too, Luanda, with my daughter. <laughs> I I feel like I have a whole series too um, up in our loft where she wants to read. She, you know, they all go through phases. It seems like. Um, but yeah, she loves the Llama Llama books. Thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, Erica is also from Minnesota, um, and you, she loves I uh, love you forever. Um, she reads this to her son. Uh, he used to read it to her son when she was a baby. Um, so I have two Minnesotians here. Um, I'm actually originally from North Dakota, so. Um, get your guys' crazy winter weather up there, um, which is pretty cold. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, well, thanks and welcome, guys, uh, um, to the live session. I'm going to continue on going um, as we move along tonight. Um, I know a lot of you guys know the live classroom expectations, but for people that are watching the recording, um, this is a good overview to know what the expectation is um, if you are participating or if you're not participating. Um, so. Yeah, so if you are attending the live session, you uh, you know, you guys are expected to engage in conversation with me, myself. Um, uh, the purpose of this is we don't really touch base on a um, uh, one-on-one -on -one basis usually, so this is kind of giving you an opportunity to have open dialogue and ask questions if you have them um, about the lesson content. Um, also, it's easy, the easiest points that you probably will get um, in this class um, by just sharing stuff during the live session um, instead of writing paragraph after paragraph after paragraph about what is expected of you um, during the live session. Um, so I know a lot of you guys cannot uh, attend, so um, that is one of the downsides of not attending is um, the video will be posted the next day and then you will be asked to complete the live session questions and answers that I ask uh, the rest of the class. So any questions that I ask, um, for instance, Erica or Luanda, um, you, you, everybody who's watching the live recording will have to answer those questions as well um, to receive full credit. Uh, usually if you, you just attend and you um, participate in the live session, you usually get full credit. So that's a pretty easy um, pretty easy way to get points. Um, do you, does Erica or Luana, do you guys have any questions about this? I feel like it's pretty straightforward. So yep, I'm going to keep jumping ahead. Uh, um, Erica, can you see the PowerPoint now, by the way? I know you logged off and then logged back on. All right, perfect. All right, let's continue on. So as we are ending, um, we're near to the end of the term. Uh, just wanted to give you guys some important dates that are um, um, coming uh, rather quickly. The last day of class is Tuesday, May 7th. Uh, no assignments will be accepted after 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time for any reason. Uh, module 5 discussion responses are due Saturday, May 4th. Uh, module 5 course projects, lesson plan part 4, um, are all due on Sunday, May 5th. The module 5 field experience report is also due on May 5th. And the most, one of the most really important things that you need uh, to know is that all field experience hours should be completed and documented on this report. And you must have 30 hours of field experience or you will not pass the course. So if you have not started to get your, your field experience hours in, um, um, time is taking try to get them in as soon as possible. Um, 
so you can pass, of course. Um, and then Module 6 discussions, they, they are due next uh, Tuesday on May 7th. No responses to peers or uh, myself are required. Um, and then the very last thing, uh, Module 6, the field experience report, is due on Tuesday, May 7th. So it's approaching quickly. We have one week left. Um, this seems to be the biggest week uh, of the term. So just make sure that you guys are planning your time accordingly so you can meet all the deadlines. All right, so wanted to check it. So how are things going as we do it? as we are near the end of the course. Um, what are your reactions to the module four content? And is there any key takeaways that you learned? Did you have any aha moments? Um, and do you know your grade um, in your class right now? And yeah, just wanna hear a little bit from you guys. Uh, if you are viewing this recording, please answer all of these questions in paragraph form. Um, to receive credit. Uh, Erica, Wanda, what's your thoughts? How has the course been so far? Um, the course has been pretty nice so far, even though I got off, well, I didn't get off. I was on a cruise for a week, so jumping back in and getting caught up was a bit of a tackle for me, but this course has been really interesting to me especially with the uh, discipline part of it, as far as the timeout is concerned, because I knew timeouts weren't always necessarily something that worked, but actually reading more about them and seeing the shaming aspect, that brought that into a bigger context for me, because I do see kids that are putting in timeouts a lot. Especially kids with special needs are always put in those timeout positions, and I do understand the de-escalation de -escalation that they need sometimes, but I just think that there's a better way to de-escalate them than to isolate them. So those were my big takeaways from this module, is figuring out better ways to de-escalate special needs kids, because they do get... Um, Escalated quite quickly, and a lot of the times it is to take away to take them the time out. So that gave me some things to think about and how I would work with my special needs kids. Um, I do read the announcements each week um, to, to stay on course and to find out how to plan my week and how to um, do my best at the assignment. And yes, I do know my grade right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that that's great to hear. I'm glad that you could uh, take away some of the strategies that are offered um, in the modules about uh, how to de-escalate children and how to put it into your practice. That is, um, as an instructor, it's always great to hear that, you know, putting what you learn into practice is that it's part of taking the course and it's key. It's key to to success in the field. So thanks for sharing, Lawanda. Awesome. And Erica is on chat. She has said in the takeaway, I will agree with Lawanda. We do not use timeouts. We redirect. I do read all of the announcements and feedback. And I also know my grade. Uh, so that is great to hear. That's great feedback um, from both of you guys uh, to know that um, things are going well and that you guys are taking stuff um, from what you've learned and putting it into practice. That's always great to hear. Um, so keep it up. Uh, remember, if you have any other, you know, if you have any questions, um, always feel free to email me. I'm always here to answer um, the questions to the best of my ability. So thank you guys. Uh, I want to take a few minutes um, as the course project, Lesson Plan Part 4, um, uh, you'll 
be completing your lesson plan that you have been working on all term. Um, so what you want to do is you want to open your Module 4 Comprehensive Lesson Plan assignment. It should already include the components from the Module 2, Module 3, and Module 4 lesson plan assignments. Please begin by going through the feedback that I left you on your previous course project assignments and making corrections and additions where necessary. You can view my feedback on the previous assignments by clicking on the My Grades tab on the left side menu of the course homepage and then clicking on the assignment. Uh, you can view in the text notes by scrolling over the highlighted areas. You can see additional notes by clicking on the rubric. And then once you have made the necessary corrections, you can open the Module 5 Comprehensive Lesson Plan template, copy and paste the entire Module 5 template onto the bottom of your revised Module 4 Comprehensive Lesson Plan. Uh, complete the Module 5 template and then submit it, the assignment as just one document. Um, for additional support you can um, on how to use the copy and paste to create one lesson plan, you can view the short video available in the, in the instructions for the assignment. Um, if you do encounter any problems um, as you complete this week's assignment, Feel free to reach out to me and email me um, so we could uh, work through any kind of barriers that you guys have. Does, does that make sense, guys? I know it's kind of a lot of information, but um, it's a lot easier um, to do it um than talking about it <laughs> uh so yeah great i'm glad that you guys um understand uh the course project and how to complete it so yeah if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me this week so i want to touch up a little bit on learning styles and teaching strategies um from last week uh, in Chapter 6, uh, you were supposed to read about different learning styles and teaching strategies. Um, you know, learning styles are how individuals perceive and process information. Um, there are three sensory channels mostly frequently used by individuals to take in information. It's, uh, you know, seeing, hearing, and then actually touching and doing. Um, so individuals who learn best by seeing are usually classified as visual learners. Um, those who learn best by hearing are classified as auditory learners. And then finally, the, the last um, people who learn by touching and moving are classified as kinesthetic learners. Uh, I, for example, um, learn best by actually doing. I am more of a kinesthetic learner. Um, a lot of times if I get a visual or something or if I hear something, it goes in one ear out the other. Um, if I see something, I will see it. Um, probably won't remember all of it. Um, but if I actually am hands-on and doing what I need to do and step-by-step -step pretty much guidance, I usually learn the best through that. Um, so um, basically, you know, there's different different people have different um, learning styles. My wife, on the other hand, is more of an auditory learner. She learns best by hearing things, and then um, usually people who have uh, a really good um, people who are auditory learners have extended vocabularies and enjoy in conversations and asking lots of questions. Um, also have great attention to detail as well, um, which is uh, a little bit about each of the learning styles. Um, so if you are viewing this recording online, um, the questions 
are how do you learn and what strategies do you use to promote children's learning? Um, I know um, it is really important um, to take into all three of these um, different learning styles into our classroom because, you know, like I mentioned, um, my wife and I learn differently from each other. Um, like I said, she's more auditory where I am more kinesthetic. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'd like to hear from you guys. How do you learn? Um, uh, Erica says that she's a visual learner. Um, and Wanda says she learns best by actually doing. Um, why do you guys think that you are a visual learner? Uh, what makes you think that you are you tend to be more that way. And Luanda, why do you think you learn best by actually doing something? Um, I think I learn best by doing. I'm like you, I can see something, but I can't always envision how it's completed. So to know how something works or how to get from point A to point B, I have to do it. And you can tell me the steps over and over, but if I don't do them, then like like you said, I miss a piece. So my best way of learning has always been hands on to do it, to sit down and go through the process myself. That way it's like a memory thing to me. My body learns it, and my brain learns it. So it's kind of I memorize it in myself. So that's that's why I know I'm better at uh, learning that way than actually hearing something or doing something. I mean, seeing something. Nice. Awesome. Thank you for your elaboration in that. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I am, I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> uh, I, I need to actually go step by step pretty much um, in order to get things done and actually have it completed. Like, yeah, I. My wife probably says, you have selected hearing. I'm just like, uh, no, I don't have selected hearing. It's just, that's just not the way I learn. Um, I don't know if it's a, a man thing or not, but um, like I said, everybody has this different um, uh, channels of learning. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you for your insights, Luanda. Um, Erica, uh, you said that you are a visual learner. You can focus more and you go at your own pace. That's always good too as well. Um, you know, having these the, the strategies of mixing these strategies in for uh, children at the preschool level um, or at the early childhood level is great. Um, it just builds on their skills. Um, and then diving into the second question of what strategies do you guys use to promote children's learning in the classroom? And um, yeah, just like to hear a little bit from you guys. Uh, again, if you are viewing this recording online, please answer this question in paragraph form. So yeah, what do you guys have to say about, uh, how do you guys use, uh, how do you promote learning? Because I work with school-age children that are kindergarten through fifth grade, we have to use a we have to use all of them because you have some kids that you have to model. Like if we're playing a game in gym, if we're doing a basketball game, you have to model throwing the ball to them or where you want the ball to go. Some kids you have to give detailed instructions, so we use a whiteboard and we write step-by-step -step instructions of what we want them to do. And some kids just have to stand off to the side and watch a game being played before that they can enter into it. So you, you incorporate all these different styles so that you can make sure that each child understands what they're doing and get the most fun out of what the game is. So it's incorporating each level for each individual because a kindergartner could be a visual learner and a fifth grader could just be a person that needs to see the instructions. So you have to make sure that we're incorporating all of that for each 
de developmental period and stage for each child. So that's one of the ways that we promote the strategies, uh, use those strategies with the kids. Thank you for sharing, Luana. That is an awesome strat. That's awesome strategies. Um, you do uh, hit on really key um, key points there as far as uh, modeling. Um, I feel like it doesn't matter what age. Um, it all stems, you know, modeling the behavior, modeling the game, or whatever you want the child to learn um, is a really, really, it's really big and is really important for their developmental um, in all aspects. So that is great um, that you um, do that, that you do meet all three of those learning styles for um, your device, your diverse uh, learning group uh, of students. Um, Erica uh, says that she does a group time to settle in um, her ABCs and count out numbers and works with toddlers, use cards um, to show them. Uh, nice. Um, I have a question a little bit for you, Erica. Um, do you guys use, since you do work um, with the younger children, do you guys use visual schedules of, of what comes first, what comes next, um, or even rules in the classroom um, with the visuals so, you know, the children could see what it is, but and yet they have the name by it so they're understanding what the sight words are too as well um, when, uh, looking and reviewing the rules yes you do so th that's another great way of um helping especially the little the young toddlers um develop that habit um of um understanding how to do that yes and you know one of the biggest things too that i've noticed um in my preschool classrooms uh, with my teachers, um, I try to have them make sure that when they have these rules and stuff that they are on um, the child's level so that they're not looking up way out of the child's reach to, um, so that it's not like way up. So it's more at their level so they could see and they could refer to it when um something um when something does go off on um, track so yeah um sometimes classrooms don't allow for that but i always tell my teachers yes you can have your environment allow for that um sometimes it just takes a little bit more planning um to actually do that Do you guys have any other thoughts on learning styles? All right, hearing and seeing that there is nothing else that you guys wanted to participate in with learning styles. Um, make sure that if you're reviewing this recording that you do answer these two questions um, and I'll elaborate on your answers. So um, the last thing for tonight, um, we are probably going to end up a little bit early, but um, first of all, uh, it's connecting with families in the communities. Um, what uh, there is in Chapter 8, there is a lot of good information um, regarding uh, families and communities and how to collaborate with them. Um, you know, sometimes there's outreaches, uh, parent conferences. 
collaborating with school districts for transition to kindergarten, parent night, volunteering, um, you name it. Um, heterosexual, homosexual families, there's just different, a lot of different um, dynamics to different families and communities. Um, but as a child teacher, we also need to know that um, no matter uh, no matter the circumstance, um, parents are the child's first teachers, and they are ultimately responsible for what their children know upon entering school. Um, basically, you know, it is our job as uh, educators to be sensitive to the families that do not attend different school functions. Um, and then, you know, having said that, um, I want to read a case study. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read the case study uh, about a real si real situation um, about the teen mother um, who was single. Um, Erica and wanted, did you guys have a chance to read that at all? It's not a big deal if you did not. Um, I could read it to you guys and then we could reflect on it. Um, and if you are viewing this, uh, online, please. You could either hear what I me read it, or you could go to your book and uh, uh, read it yourselves, and then answer the questions that follow up. Um, so yeah, it, it looks like you guys have not read it, and that's completely fine. So I will read it to you, and then we can have just a little discussion to end our live session tonight about um, connecting with families and communities and what that looks like. Um, so yeah. Uh, in the field in chapter, I think it's chapter eight, uh, field notes being a teen mother and being single. Um, so I'm going to read it out loud and then we could reflect. So as I ref I'm going to go ahead and start. As I reflect back and move forward, there is no doubt that I was a troubled teen. Upon graduation from high school, I found out I was pregnant. What were my options? What would my life hold for my child and me? As a young indigenous working class woman, I would become another casualty of social inequities that would position my child to follow a path of poverty and disempowerment. Yes, I had a loving family and yes, I had a personal drive, but I didn't have wealth, racial or gender privilege. Because of my perseverance and familial love, I entered an urban community college. There I met a faculty mentor who helped me empower myself. Without his belief in me, I may not have been able to believe in myself. My daughter was born at the end of my first year. I was worried about how I could continue school and care for my newborn. My mentor encouraged me to bring her to school when my family was unable to help. He would watch her in her office while I attended class. I had an academic home. Now, not all my experiences were positive because I was a teenage mom. I was often talked down to, expected to do poorly academically, and it was assumed that I provided inadequate care for my child. For example, I was strongly discouraged by the college to attend parenting classes. Although I learned valuable information about the importance of play and had wonderful opportunities to learn songs and games with my child, I also was positioned as the teenage mother, the at-risk parent. These educators failed to understand that my experiences gave me an incredible life tool. I was raised by a hardworking single mother and loving family. My parental funds of knowledge came from a loving community that cherished each child as a sacred gift. We may not have been always lavished with extravagant gifts, but we were always immersed in love. In reflecting back, I realized how much I believe in the power of fierce hopefulness through mentorship and love. For me, the stereotypical portrayals of being a teen mom and, and social inequities were what could have been my roadblock. I urge all teachers and caregivers 
examine their biases about teen moms and the social issues that impact the lives of young mothers. Every mom, as well as every child, deserves empowering spaces where they can succeed. So sharing that um, story, uh, it's a real life story. Um, maybe some of you guys have witnessed um, or even experienced that yourselves. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the case study? And how does your program connect with the families and communities that you guys serve? I, it's just time for, um, you know, share your thoughts um, of what you guys do as a center. It's always good to take away what other people do at other different locations. Um, I know for our Head Start program, we do a lot of things. We do have parenting classes. We have uh, cooking classes. We have, um, there's just so much that our program offers. Uh, one, we are a, uh, we, we are umbrellaed by the county, which gives us funds and gives us access to a lot of different things that normal Head Starts probably would not get as well. Um, and, you know, we are federally funded too as well, so we do get different funds um, to do these things and promote literacy by doing cultural activities. We have a culture fest that's coming up. It's kind of the end of the year celebration where we invite all parents um, through Adams County community, um, which is, you know, it's 500,000 people um, in our county um, that are invited. Um, usually it's just the families and some friends, the friends of the families that do come out, but it's a good way for the uh, public um, to get to know different communities and uh, different things about different cultures and, um, you know, help understand that there's different people have different stories and different things that they go through through life and it's just kind of a celebration that we do to invite um everybody to have you know free food uh free dancing free books uh face painting just one big extravagant end of the year celebration that we do offer to our families and community um, so I feel like that's one of the one of the big ways that we reach out, and there's also lots of vendors too that do come out um, to make this happen. So yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit for you from you guys. Um, so yeah, um, I I did enjoy the case study. I just as a whole in society, I wish we would stop labeling and trying to deter what makes, once a, once a, a young woman is in, you know, in that situation, to beat her down does not encourage anything. Instead, I just wish we would be, we would come more into encouraging her and giving them the options of what they can succeed instead of saying how their lives are ruined because of this particular incident. Um, as for our community, our community, um, we do have a lot of um, resources in Anoka Hennepin, where I'm, where I'm from, where we do connect to the human health services, where we can give them um, housing help, uh, funding help. Uh, we have social workers. There's a lot of different um, resources that can be referred to them. Even on the elementary level, we have social workers that can help families. Um, we also have them at the high school level. So we do have a lot of um, resources out in my area that are for not just teen mothers, but homeless teens in general. Teens that, you know, have are down on their luck. They do have a program where they have, they can get housing if they're between, I think it's 
starts at 18 to 25, somewhere in there. So there are a lot of different resources, and we do get a handbook within our program to help us to refer the families if they find themselves in those situations. That is great to hear, Lawanda, um, that your program provides those services to the, you know, not, you know, the people that need, families that need the most help. Um, and you do fit on one of the key thing that um, I'd like to point out um, with what you had said is people do label people and it's unfortunate and it's really actually sad to see. The reality is I don't think our world will stop labeling people because people are sinners. We are sinners from the beginning and people just continue to sin um, even by by doing that, by labeling people, which is unfortunate. But it's great that you brought up that, you know, everybody makes mistakes. The question is, what is our responsibility as educators? We need to do what's best for the children and the families. And what's best for children and families are to provide the services we can to the people and the families that need the most help. And I think that you guys do, you know, you do an awesome job from what I, from what you just said is to recognize that and ensure that that is happening. Um, and it's, it's great to hear that your program does that and your thoughts around the case study uh, is great because yeah, we all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. <laughs> Um, as much as people think that they are, nobody's perfect. <laughs> and we just, you know, we we go through bumps, we go through trials in life, and we have to make sure that we, you know, pretty much love one another and make sure that we, uh, um, you know, even if we disagree with people's life choices, that we support them the best we can, especially in a position of being an educator. So yeah, thank you for sharing, Lawanda. Um, I know Erica said something in the chat box. Um, uh, uh, Erica said that's a great story. We do have a few teen moms and they do come for us to help. Uh, and question, we do our best and give resources for the families. We do offer a family fun night with food and games. Um, yeah, so that, that's great that you guys have uh, stuff and resources to help out the, the um, you know, not just even single moms. Um, there might be single dads, too, or, you know, in our program, we had two um, grandpas that were uh, um, not even biological to a little girl who was taking care of her um, while, you know, mom was... Um, away so it's you know there's just there's different dynamics um and we just got to make sure that we do the best we can to provide the resources to have best outcomes for our children and families so yeah thank you for sharing everyone um do you guys have anything else on the matter of connecting with families in communities? All right, hearing and seeing that we do not have any other questions regarding uh, the case study. Um, and remember, if you are viewing this on uh, recording, please answer these questions and paragraph form. Um, so that pretty much completes the live session tonight. Um, do you guys have any questions presented in the live session, uh, course assignments or anything else related to the course? And if you don't have any questions, um, 
regarding uh, the material provided. Um, and if you have a question that does come up later, feel free to ask. Um, and I will try to respond to you as soon as I can. Um, so um, I'm guessing hearing and seeing that there is no questions. Um, I'm going to end the live session. Uh, thank you, Lawanda and Erica, uh, for your participation. It's greatly appreciated. And feel free to, if you guys need to reach out for anything. Thank you. Have a great night.